Assalamu alaikum everyone. Welcome back. I'm Jake, the Muslim metaphysician. And today we have a, another special episode. Every time is a special episode, guys. <laughs> uh, today is going to be a review of a recent discussion between Dr. Timothy Paul and Dr. R.T. Mullins or Ryan Mullins. Um, some of you may be familiar with Ryan uh, because he's been a guest on my show. What is it? Maybe th I think three times now. I think he came on twice individually and then a third time he came on to have a discussion with uh, Dr. Joshua Sijuade, uh, where they had a discussion. So he, he should be familiar to you guys. If not, they're in the description of the video. If you click on it, you'll see the original video, which I'm going to be reviewing today. And then underneath that, you'll see it says interview with Dr. Mullins on my channel regarding this topic. Uh, because on the topic that we're going to discuss today, I had... Um, Ryan on where I interviewed him on an article that he wrote, which was directly related to this topic. So um, that should be helpful if people have not watched it already. Um, you know, it should give you further detail if you think that this topic is interesting and you want to look into it a bit further and see what Ryan maybe in a bit more detail uh, would have said in that discussion or what he said in other places in his published works and other um, public appearances on YouTube, my channel being one of them. And he's, he's, I think, talked about this in other places as well. Anyway, so that's Ryan. Um, he's a Christian philosopher and theologian. Um, he, you know, really, I don't really need to <laughs> give too much details on him. Uh, he's pretty well known, uh, Tim, and he's a Protestant, by the way, which is going to be somewhat relevant to the discussion today. Uh, Dr. Timothy Paul is also a Christian, and he's a Catholic, um, so he much more closely is concerned about following the ecumenical councils. He's written on a book. Uh, he's written a book on the topic of what's called conciliar Christology or Christology, uh, which is the study of Christ, but in this case is really referring mostly to the incarnation and the councils associated with the incarnation, um, and basically trying to construct a model of the incarnation that is in line, of course, with scripture, but in, in this aspect, um, trying to be as close as he can to be in conformity with the uh, councils of the church, which are the earlier ecumenical councils. Anyway, there's, I could give a lot more detail in terms of the background of the whole discussion, but that's gonna, <laughs> that would make the video far too long, uh, to be quite honest with you. Now, I have, of myself, I've gone into quite a bit of detail on this topic and the incarnation in my series that's available for free to take on Sapiens Institute's website in which I have a PDF that's available for free download there, something like, I don't know, 250 to 300 slides. And um, I go into quite a bit of detail on several issues that are brought up in this uh, discussion. But with that being said, I don't want to belabor the point too much. I'm going to share my screen here as I normally do. And I am going to start the video inshallah so give me one second here this is not the right one this should be it here okay okay so can everybody see that should be available to be seen so this is on a channel which is called the london lyceum um it was literally just a few days ago today's the 16th it was published or streamed live on august 12th now, this video is a two-part discussion. I, however, am only going to focus on one part of um, this video because it's just too much to go through in one video. The video in total is two hours, and it's split up into two parts. 
So the first part was on classical theism and Ryan and, and Dr. Paul went back and forth on that, discussing that and trying to hash some things out. And then the second half of the discussion was on conciliar Christology. The structure of it is going to be that Ryan basically starts off with an introduction to the topic, explains a potential problem uh, via an argument against uh, conciliar Christology, or at least he's presenting it to uh, provoke a conversation about the subject at the very least. Let's just say that. I don't, I don't want to put too many uh, words in his mouth that he wouldn't be comfortable saying. So I hope I'm accurately representing him. And I'm sure I will hear from him if he watches this video and he thinks that I, I've said anything that was uh, incorrect and not accurately representing either him or uh, Dr. Paul. Dr. Paul, by the way, I don't know. Um, Ryan, I know quite well. Um, I would consider him a friend. Um, Dr. Paul, I don't know too well personally. I've never really spoken to him. Um, I only know him through his written works. I've read several of his uh, texts and articles related to this subject and others. Although um, I was actually supposed to have a, uh, he's one of the people that I was supposed to, uh, supposed to, sorry, potentially have a conversation with, uh, with respect to the incarnation uh, on this specific topic, actually, on the Capturing Christianity channel. But as we know, uh, there was a falling out there, not from Tim's side, but between myself and um, uh, Capturing Christianity. So, the, uh, Cameron, I should say. Anyway, so he was somebody that is considered an expert on the topic of the Incarnation, at least in, in modern terms. He has written uh, a book on the subject and, and done a lot of research on it, and he has his own views. Um, from what I can tell, this was a very uh, nice, cordial conversation. Ryan and uh, Dr. Paul, I think, made a lot of progress throughout the conversation. And overall, I thought it was a very informative conversation in general. And so that's why I've chosen to do a review on that today here. So let me just find the place because um, I have a note as to where this starts on the clip here. Uh, give me one second. Okay. So it should be starting around 53 minute mark, I think. Let me see here. Okay. Okay. <laughs> if you don't, if you don't watch, no, this is not, this is, uh, we're still talking about whether it's, you know, the other stuff that that is. So I could give logical. Um, take a disjunctive term. Like, the last issue of Jeff's yeah. Christian Physicalism? Yeah, that's the most recent one. Chapters on this. You had, as if we have time, mm -hmm. I think. Oh. Thank God. Um, I love in a different way that God loves. I mean, okay, I, I think it should be starting here, guys. I have an accident, for instance, by which I do it. And on my view, God doesn't have an accident um, by which he does it. That's helpful. Okay, so right around the hour mark is when they you know, finished a conversation on classical theism and the problems and solutions associated with that. And then this is where they begin to have a discussion about, um, <clears throat> sorry, this is where they begin to have a discussion about conciliar Christology. So there's an hour left and I do want to get, and I'm going to try to play this on one and a half speed. Uh, if you guys feel that it's too fast, let me know in the chat of time to two sons worry because mm -hmm. i think that's pretty fun and interesting so we can circle back to these discussions if we have time at the end but let's go ahead and make the adjustment ryan i think you had you put together a formal argument because you've got several chapters on this um so if, if you want to know more about ryan's argument on this i think you've got it in what that like this christian physicalism book and then you've got a new a one places. Is, uh, there you go yeah it's yeah so the, temptation yeah that's the most recent one um and then i've got a version of it in the uh, in the physicalism the Christian physicalism question mark. Uh, so I guess you have to say yeah. Christian physicalism. Um, and then in the so the last issue of uh, Philosophia Christi, I think I have a slightly uh, modified version of that because someone pointed out a really obvious hole in my physicalism argument. Uh, Keith Hess didn't know. I was like, oh gosh, I need to fix that. So um, so there's a, there's a modified version of it in uh, the, I think it's the most recent issue of Philosophia Christi or maybe the one before that. I don't know. Um, yeah. So uh, let me share my screen again here. So it's, okay, it's already sharing. Um, bring this up here. So I got it. I normally don't make these PowerPoint presentations, but Tim inspired me to. So I'm like, all right, let's go with it. Okay. So this is the two sons worry. So uh, let me start again with just some assumptions that are really common among the church fathers. And so I'll call them, uh, you know, the C for church fathers. So C1, the self is a rational mind. So this is when uh, Ryan just starts out by 
presenting an argument, which he calls the two sons wary. Now he's written a, an article, at least one that I know of, uh, he's discussed it in other places. And we go through his article in the link that you can find in the description of this video. Okay. in which you will see one second here. Uh, it says interview with Dr. Mullins on my channel regarding this topic. Um, if you click on that link, you will find uh, it in much more detail where we go through this problem, which is called the two sons wary. Because in Christian theology, Orthodox Christ Christian theology, anyway, the idea of the incarnation or God becoming a man is one person with two natures. So you have the one person who is Christ or the word or it's the son, it's a uh, uh, different terminology is used to refer to the person of Christ. And that one person, the son, has two complete natures, one divine nature and one human nature. And so the two sons worry is the idea that, well, the incarnation was going to result in there being not only one son, as is claimed by orthodoxy, but actually two sons i.e. you have a divine son and a human son in some sense, right? And that is that view was declared heretical, um, and the heresy associated with that is called Nestorianism. It's the idea that Christ not only had two natures, but he was two persons, okay? Now, I understand that some people may not understand all the intricacies of the terminology and the background associated with this, but I'm assuming that people watching this video are somewhat familiar with my channel and things that I've said in the past. So please forgive me because I'm not really able to, in order to save time, I'm not able to go into a lot of detail about these points. Um, anyway, let me go over to here. Uh, one second here. Uh, okay. Okay. So, somebody's making a comment about my beard. Uh, <laughs> some people like it. Some people don't. Okay, that's fine. Anyway, let's get back to it, and let me continue playing. So Ryan is going to start by presenting the actual argument. Mind or soul. Uh, and then C2, a human person is a rational mind slash soul employing a human body. And it's what I'm doing there is actually just kind of, this is the language that you see from people like Origen, Basil, uh, Cyril, and a bunch of others. They'll use this kind of phrase of like, you are a soul. You are, like, that's what you are. You are a rational mind, and you are human because you are employing a human body. Uh, and then Fred Sanders has this really funny uh, statement where he says, if you've somehow, like, you know, you're living in, in, in the contemporary world and you're somehow, like, not embarrassed to be a substance dualist, then you have this shared metaphysical assumption this, uh, with, the, with, the, with the early church fathers. So you should be able to understand what they're up to with the Christology because of this. Uh, now, C3, this is a really common one amongst all people, uh, is to say there's this one son rule. Uh, Jesus Christ is one person and not two. You only want God the Son to be the only person there. You don't want there to be God the Son and there to be this human son in there. That's two people. It's two too many. We don't want that. We want one son. And then C4, in becoming incarnate is Jesus Christ, God the Son assumes a rational soul and a human body. This is a very common assumption. Okay, so first what he's doing here, he's, lit, he's starting off with some assumptions or what he considers some widely held assumptions by the church fathers. So the first premise is a self or a person is a rational mind or soul. Then he says that a human person is a rational mind slash soul employing a human body. Uh, the third is the one son rule, which I just explained. Jesus Christ is one person, not two. And then the, the last premise, uh, in becoming incarnate as Jesus Christ, God the Son assumes a rational soul and human body. So it's a three-part Christology. You have God the Word who takes on both a human soul and a human body. So you have, quote unquote, three parts. One part, the Word. Second part, a rational human soul, and uh, third part, a human body. Now, there's lots of different versions of the two sons worry that predate uh, Chalcedon that go really, really early back. Uh, but here's one. This is a version that comes from this guy named Eunomius that I think's got some teeth to it. And so here's how I want to articulate Eunomius' version of it. So E for Eunomius. So E1. So now he's giving a formulation, uh, or what how he understands to be a formulation of Eunomius' argument. Uh, against this typical understanding of the incarnation. Eunomius was considered to be a, an Arian uh, heretic of some sort. 
Um, uh, so, but anyway, he, he, he also has a problem with at least what was conceived of as the orthodox Christology of his time. And he gives a criticism associated with that. So Ryan is given a modern uh, formulation insofar as he understands Eunomius' argument. A human person is a rational soul and a human body. And that's just, you know, okay, that's, that's, that's the assumption, C2. E2, if the son assumed a soul and a body, the son assumed a human person. E3, the son assumed a soul and a body. Well, thus, the son assumed a human person. Ooh, okay, that's, that's not good. We don't want that. And now, if the son assumed a human person, then there are two people, two sons in Jesus Christ. Ooh, this is not looking good. Now, uh, thus, there are two people, two sons in Jesus Christ. Now, E7, if there are two people, two sons in Jesus Christ, then the one son rule is false. E8, thus, the one son rule is false. So that's, that's not good. So here's... Uh, by the way, I just want to stop it there, and I was just reminded as Ryan's going through this argument, if you go on my channel and you go in the video section and go all the way down about to the beginning of my channel, when I, uh, or at least in the videos that are available now, I think it's about three years ago, I presented an argument and challenge to Orthodox Christology and you'll find a very similar formulation of this argument going back over three years ago. Uh, and that was before I even knew or was acquainted with Ryan Mullins. Um, so we've, we've come to formulate similar arguments uh, somewhat independently, right? Uh, which is very interesting. But anyway, here it goes. Here's what most people want to do. They usually want to attack E2. They want to go, I want to reject E2. And so this is the part where I'm going to come into the story, because I think there are lots of different attempts to, to reject E2, uh, and I don't find them satisfying, because they look indistinguishable from Nestorianism. And since Nestorianism was condemned, you don't want your view to look almost identical to you know, Nestorius' view. And so here are the two kind of versions that I, two, two uh, brief uh, replies I want to look at. So the first is ineffable mystery, and then the second is the assumption relation. So uh, let me start with Actually, E2, let me stop the, it there, uh, and I ought to just briefly explain how he got to this conclusion here. Um, okay, so... We, we already saw the previous assumption. So you have premise one, a human person is a, a rational soul and a body. Um, now, premise two, if the son assumed a, a soul and a body, then the son a human person assumed a human person. It just follows from the first premise. Um, the, the, the son assumed a soul and a body. Okay. Um, which, it, again, is, is just part of what Ryan considers to be the orthodox view, which is correct. Thus, the son assumed a human person. Well, if a soul, a human soul and a human body are sufficient for human personhood, and the son assumed those two, then he must have assumed a human person. Now, then he goes on to say, if the son assumed a human person, then there are two people or two sons in Christ. One, a human person, and one, a divine person. Because remember, Christ, or in virtue of the Trinity, there being three persons in the Trinity, the Son is a divine person prior to the Incarnation. Then the sixth premise, thus there are two people, two sons in Christ, which is a big problem. If there are two people or two sons in Jesus Christ, then the one son rule is false, which would contradict orthodoxy. Thus the one son rule is false. The idea that there are two sons... Uh, divine son and a human son or two persons in Christ, as I said, is a heretical view known as Nestorianism. So basically what he's trying to show is he's trying to show that there's a potential internal inconsistency between orthodox conciliar Christology and the claims that it itself makes. Namely, it condemns Nestorianism or the idea that there are two persons on the one hand However, on the other hand, other propositions that it seems to hold to would actually lead to Nestorianism. So on the one hand, it's affirming Nestorianism, and on the other hand, it's condemning Nestorianism. And so you have this internal tension uh, in Orthodox conciliar Christology. This is what Ryan is attempting to show at this point. There are lots of different attempts to, to reject E2, uh, and I don't find them satisfying because they look indistinguishable from Nestorianism. And since Nestorianism was condemned, you don't want your view to look almost identical to, because, they, because I think there are lots. Yeah, what he's trying to say is the, the orthodox, uh, the person that's trying to hold to orthodox conciliar Christology in light of this argument, they're gonna try to deny uh, E2, okay? So they want to try to deny the idea 
that if the son assumed a soul and a human body, then the son assumed a human person. But given a E1, or the idea that a human person is a soul and a body, it seems very difficult how, if he assumed that, that he wouldn't be a human person, right? And so now he's going to show two strategies that attempt to mitigate that, and which he explains why he doesn't think that they're successful. Lots of different attempts to, to reject E2, uh, and I don't find them satisfying, because they look indistinguishable from Nestorianism. And since Nestorianism was condemned, you don't want your view to look almost identical to you know, Nestorius' view. And so here are the two kind of versions that are two uh, brief uh, replies I want to look at. So the first is ineffable mystery, and then the second is the assumption relation. So uh, let me start with E2, with the uh, ineffable mystery move. So the hypostatic union is said to be ineffably mysterious, in which case we have no way of knowing what the difference is between orthodoxy and Nestorianism. And you could cheekily say, you know, the orthodox view is just whatever is not Nestorian, but I don't think that really tells me anything about what the orthodox view is. And this is going to be a problem since on the surface, it really looks like the orthodox view is identical to Nestorianism. And even Nestorius himself said that the orthodox view is the one that he always held. When he, after Chalcedon came out, he was like, yeah, that's what I've been saying all along, guys. So, so merely asserting, look, I swear, I've got, you know, my view is unspeakably different from Nestorius's. I don't think that's going to help cast off the appearance of heresy. Now, you might be tempted to say that the hypostatic union is a primitive notion. So you might say that when people like Cyril keep playing the mystery card in order to like, avoid like really obvious entailment relations, you could say, well, Cyril's not being intellectually dishonest. Cyril's not playing hard to get. Uh, you know, when he's playing the mystery card, he's not doing anything corrupt or cheeky. Instead, you could say Cyril is just claiming that the hypostatic union is a primitive notion that is not further analyzable. I've got two concerns about this. Uh, the first is I don't think this is going to be insufficient to ward off the appearance of Nestorianism because I don't think this is an accurate representation of Cyril. So we know that Cyril often engages in corrupt, persuasive tactics, like holding a council before his opponents are even able to arrive to defend themselves. And Cyril is known to have bribed the emperor. He even sent people to constantly shout insults at the emperor in order to get his way. So we know for a fact that Cyril is often engaging in corrupt and intellectually dishonest tactics. And then people in Cyril's own day, this is, this is a quote from some people in his own day, they declare that Cyril was a monster born and educated to destroy the church. So Cyril didn't make a lot of friends. So in light of this, I think it's safe to say that Cyril's constant abuse of the mystery card, uh, abuse is uh, what I heard Sarah Coakley say once. So the, his constant abuse of the mystery card is not entirely intellectually honest. And then second, when some notion is primitive, it's not further analyzable in terms of some more fundamental concepts, but the character of the concept can be explicated. And so appeals to inevitable mystery, they are refusals to explicate the character of the concept. They are conveniently incomplete stories that allow the player of the mystery card to avoid objections because the player has refused to fully explain the view. And I think this is unfortunate since there are multiple proposals in the contemporary literature that do give a full story that avoids Nestorianism. So what I have in mind are views like Geert de Wies, Wayne Lane Craig, and Andrew Loke. And these are proposals that classical theists, they're not willing to accept. So when it comes to deciding, say, between like Andrew Loke's view and some unknowable mystery view, I don't know why I should go with an unknowable mystery view. But let me return to a previous point I made. So the different classical attempts to offer the hypostatic union, I still see them as indistinguishable from Nestorianism, in which case it's a mystery how it is not Nestorian. And so let me give you a couple quick examples of this. So like I pointed out earlier, Nestorius says that Chalcedon, he's like, yeah, that's what I always believed, guys, come on. Second, the Tome of Leo, which is endorsed to Chalcedon, says that each nature is working in fellowship with each other. And so that's orthodoxy. But Theodore of Mopsusia also says that these two things, they're working in a fellowship too, but he gets condemned. That's, that's a mystery to me. Third, Cyril says that the word indwells his man. That is apparently an orthodox view. But Theodore and Nestorius say the same thing, and it's somehow mysteriously a heresy. Fourth, Theodore says that the relationship between the word and the will of Jesus is like God's relationship with the saints. And that's, you know, that's condemned as heresy. But then Aquinas says the same thing, uh, and that's, that's, that's orthodoxy. Then fifth, Theodore, and Nestorius, and Cyril say that the word assumes the man Jesus by a union of good pleasure. This is a really important phrase, the union of good pleasure. Theodore and Nestorius are condemned as heretics for affirming this union, but Cyril is affirmed as orthodox. Something seems mysterious to me. And if, it's, if the mystery in your mind is, well, how is this not Nestorian? You're not the only one. Because people in 435, in, in Cyril's own party, they suspected him of being Nestorian. And then after Chalcedon, after the formula of Chalcedon, uh, Chalcedon was made, many people in the East were going, how, how are you guys not Nestorian? Uh, they even referred to it as a sickness uh, because they thought it was still Nestorian. And then the church had to hold a fifth ecumenical council, Constantinople II, in order to rid uh, this theology of any Nestorian tendencies. Because like the Emperor Justinian was really annoyed that all these Nestorians were able to affirm the Chalcedonian formula. He's like, no, 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 you guys can't affirm that. They're like, yeah, we do. And he's like, okay, but we we're going to hold the council. We got to get rid of this Nestorian stuff. So that's the first kind of move you can make is ineffable mystery. And I want to go, look, Nestorian, bro. I got to do something else. Here's the final um, one I want to look at. So what you've got here is this thing called the assumption relation. Uh, and this is another way you could try to deny E2. So Peter Lombard, uh, he's, he notices this problem. And so here's the... Okay, so what he was just explaining with that is he was showing a historical account of, and he chose to focus on St. Cyril's view or St. Cyril sometimes pronounced. Uh, his view, because he had one of the ec uh, was the head of one of the ecumenical councils, or at least his writings were uh, submitted as such. Um, and so he was an authority. Um, he was an authority with regard to this subject. And what he's trying to say or present here, in terms of the historical account, is look, you have somebody who's considered to be bona fide orthodox in his Christology and his understanding of the incarnation like Cyril 
and he's saying these type of things and his position seems to be X. And then you have Nestorius who seems to be saying pretty much the same thing. One is applauded and the other one is condemned. And so what's going on here? What actually is the real distinction between the two views in order to justify this difference? And he doesn't think that there is one other than ineffable mystery, meaning it's utterly mysterious. We can we just say there's a difference, even though we cannot point to an actual metaphysical difference. The objection that he considers, which is a slightly different version of the two sons where it's very much in the same neighborhood. So the objection is, for a person is a rational substance of an individual nature. Thanks, Boethius. But that is what a soul is. And so if the word took a soul, it also took a person. And, ooh, okay, now we're going to get, you know, we're going to get too many persons in Jesus. That's bad. But Peter says, well, hang on a second. That, that, that does not follow because the soul is not a person when it is united personally to another thing. But when it is, you know, but only, only when it exists by itself, that's only when it's a person. But that particular soul, it never existed without being joined to another thing. And so it was not the case that taking of that soul was the taking of a person. Okay, here's what I want, I want you to notice here. Here's Lombard's basic strategy. He's like, look, if that soul existed by itself, it'd be a person. Okay, you know, sure, fine. But that soul never came into existence uh, by itself. From the moment it began to exist, it was united to the sun. So therefore, it's not a person. That's Peter Lombard's basic strategy. Here's the problem. Theodore of Mopsustia said the exact same thing. And he was condemned as a heretic. He was condemned as a historian. So Nestorius and Theodore, they both make this exact same move in order to avoid the heresy of adoptionism, but they get condemned as Nestorians as a separate heresy. But when, when Peter Lombard says it, it's totally cool, it's all gravy. That's, that's, that's weird. It's very weird. And then one final thing, and this is what some of the stuff that Tim and I talked about earlier, I think, I, I think it's, it's going to be really weird to talk about, uh, for a classical piece, to talk about there's this intimate, super awesome, amazing relationship between the son and his human nature if God is not really related to the human nature. Uh, and so Aquinas, he says this, so here's a quote from Aquinas, he says, the union of which we are speaking is a relation which we consider between the divine and the human nature inasmuch as they come together in one person of the Son of God. Now, as I said above, because you know, he talked about this stuff earlier, every relation which we consider between God and the creature is really in the creature, by whose change the relation is brought into being, whereas it is not really in God, but only in our way of thinking, since it does not arise from any change in God. And hence, we must say that the union of which we are speaking is not really in God, except only in our way of thinking, but in the human nature, which is a creature, it is really. And so here's the problem I see it, as I see it, God the Son is not really related to me. And God the Son's not really related to the human nature of Jesus either. So what is the difference between me and Jesus? And I think it just seems impossible to affirm that there's some intimate, unique, hypothetical union where the Son is not really related to the soul and body of Jesus, except in our way of thinking. That just, I think, makes the incarnation a non-starter. And then notice, I've not even pointed out how this particular version of the assumption relation violates the and in hypostasia theology that's endorsed at the Fifth Ecumenical Council, because I'm trying to keep this shorter. If we can get into that, if you guys want, but I've gone on long enough, and I, and I want to make sure that Tim gets a chance to respond to all of this. Okay, so that last objection that he was talking about, the on versus n hypostasius distinction, if you want to see uh, more detail about that, you can check out my interview with him on the two sons worry on my channel, inshallah, which is in the description of this video. But anyway, <clears throat> he was um, refuting this idea of the assumption relation, which is... <coughs> You know, Peter Lombard's claim, anyway, uh, you know, of, of talking about, well, these two things come together, but they, they don't actually form another distinct person. He points out, well, other people who are considered heretics have said similar things, but yet they were still declared heretics. So he's just pointing out a, an apparent uh, historical inconsistency. And then he goes on to another very powerful from my perspective, an interesting argument, which I go into in a lot of detail. Uh, well, I shouldn't talk it up that much, but I go into it in significant detail in my course on Sapiens Institute regarding the subject, which I explain a very similar argument um, based on what Aquinas says and how it's understood um, under classical theism. So this is the idea that God is not really related to anything in creation meaning there's no real relation between God and anything that he's created. There's only a one way or what's called a mixed relation between creation and God. Okay. So it's like, I hate, I hate to put it in a mocking way, but it's kind of like you sticking your hand out to God. Okay. And God is not in any way trying to be related to you. Um, it's like a one way friendship. <laughs> Um, again, I'm not trying to mock it or anything. I'm just trying to find a, find an analogy to make it easy for people to understand. So God is not really related to anything in creation. Creation is related to God in some sense. Now, the question is, and Thomas Aquinas actually does tackle this specifically, although Ryan didn't bring up the quote, I don't think. Um, 
where on the issue of the incarnation, there's a question about, well, if God is not really related to anything in creation, is the son, the second person, the Trinity, really related to its human nature? And Aquinas, in terms of trying to be consistent, he has to answer no, because the question is, is Christ's human nature created or is it uncreated? If it's uncreated, then what, what is this weird uncreated human nature? What does that even mean? So he has to cancel that out. So obviously it's created. So the position is that Christ's human nature is created. Well, if Christ's human nature is created and God is not really related to anything creation, then would have to follow that God could not, including the Son, the second person of the Trinity, the Son could not actually be really related to his own human nature or Christ's human nature, the created human nature. And this is a big problem because if the son is not really related to his own human nature, well, he's also not really related to me or anything else in creation. So then what is the significance of the incarnation? What actually is it? It's not what's called a transformation or a caterpillar turning into a butterfly. Okay. Most Christians would reject that. Most Christians take what's called a relational theory of the incarnation. There are two broad schools. You have what's called the transformational uh, uh, Christology, which is very minority view, which is like a, a radical transformation. God literally changing into a man like Zeus or something weird like that, which is mostly rejected. And then you have what's called the relational theory, which is God becomes related to a human nature. Right. But under this view, because of the commitments to classical theism, that God is not really related to anything in creation. Uh, and I got a big fly in my <laughs> room here flying around. It's pretty annoying um, because God is not really related to anything in creation. If Christ's human nature is created, then he couldn't be really related to his human nature. And then it calls out the question, well, what in the hell is the incarnation then at that point? It just doesn't make any sense as to it loses the significance. Then it just basically would boil down to a, a human nature, a special human creature that is related in a special way to God. Well, from a Muslim paradigm, that's just what a prophet is. A prophet of God, in our perspective, is a creation of God, which is specially related to God himself. And obviously receives revelation and, and all these other type of things, right? And so then on that view, it just seems that it's just the Muslim view or something very similar. Doesn't seem to be a real, very much of a distinction at that point. When you say that the son is not even really related to his own human nature. Okay. So this is a very serious objection and problem uh, for the Christian view. Um. Somebody said, can we say that R.T. Mullins is the Christian metaphysician? He might like that title. I don't know. I have to ask him. <laughs> but he calls himself an analytic theologian. That's what he goes by. But sure, you could call him a Christian metaphysician. Um, let's see. Okay. Is the son then really related to the father and the Holy Spirit? Well, the son, in the sense of the second person of the Trinity, would be really related to the Father and the Holy Spirit under classical Christian uh, theology. But in terms of in terms of the son being the human nature, then um, the human nature would be really related to um, God or the Trinity or the Word, but um, the son himself would not still not be really related to creation. And in that case, he wouldn't be related to Christ's human nature. So yeah, there's a, there's a real relation between the father, son, and Holy spirit, but not between, um, not between God and, uh, Jesus's human nature. Okay. So I hope that's clear. Now, anyway, let's go further and let's give a chance for uh, Tim to come in here and, and offer some type of response. Consider between the divine and the human nature. Inasmuch between me and our way, only it, what is the difference? 
Uh, Save yourselves. So Tim, I'll let you go. Your dad first, Jordan. That's good. Let's see. Uh, I have some replies. Ryan has uh, some quotations that I'd like to pull up later. We'll see if I have to. Uh, I might not have to, so maybe get on the ready, but don't do anything just yet, Ryan. Um, uh, For some reason, my computer isn't set up to let me do it. Sorry about that. That is to share my own screen. But I've got responses of two different forms. One is response to just the eunomian presentation of the argument itself. I'm going to argue something's wrong with it. And secondly, I've got three responses to where Ryan says he enters the discussion. You remember he said he, uh, he sees an alleged indistinguishability of the Nestorian views and the hypostatic union responses. He says that uh, ineffability is a problem. And he says, we talked about this already, but real relations and the incarnation, that, that third bit as well. And I'm happy to do it back and forth so you don't get a whole dump of four objections and try to remember them and then go back. So to the first, to the eunomian argument. One thing you said, Ryan, uh, is in your two premises, C2 and E1, I'll read them out loud for us. But C2 said, a human person is a rational mind soul employing a human body and the other one that is let me scroll up to real quick the other one uh e1 said a human person is a rational soul and a human body now in those two you use the word is and you're relating human person on one side of the is to a rational soul and a human body on the other side of the is and i'm wondering what sort of is do we have here is it a composition relation is it a constitution relation is it strict identity if it's composition if it's composition you might in fact have cyril on your side so here's one quotation from cyril i'll read that loud if, and we can put it up on the screen if people need it later Cyril says in his third letter to Nestorius, this is in the Ecumenical Councils, uh, he says, quote, He reads a quote here. It's not, not really all that relevant. Be kept, uh, no, not in the same same composition time. relations. I don't understand the ideology. What makes Constitution, for instance, I uh, I was trying to give a Yeah, I see. I could get rid of a um, Okay. Yeah. So that was a you enter in uh, to the session after Eunomius. I mean, they're just presenting his view. Uh, yeah. And that's so basically what tim was trying to say there in the idea um i think if we went back some i have to go back to the beginning here um uh, a human person is a rational soul and a human body he's wondering what is this and is is this an is of composition is this an is of constitution is this an is of identity uh, what what is this or it is of predication um, uh, so <laughs> some people think it's just a Muslim who's been pedantic with this word is but Dr. Timothy Paul who is an Orthodox Christian and by that I mean he holds to the councils he's a Catholic um, he is pressing to see what is the meaning of this word is in this sense and he's right to point out that it's probably going to have to function as some type of is of identity. Um, this is really just a semantic point. I don't think it's really all that substantive or, I mean, it's relevant because of the way the argument is presented, but the, the argument is not going to really turn on this. It just might not, might need to be reformulated in different, slightly different semantics or terminology. But the way that I did it in my video is I said, Premise one, a rational soul and a human body or a human soul and a human body are sufficient for human personhood. That's the way that I personally stated it. So I don't know if that might work out better for uh, Ryan, a human person, or I said it like this, a rational soul and a human body are sufficient for human personhood okay now if somebody wants to deny that then they need to tell us just what are the conditions for human personhood and what i think comes out in this discussion is that it seems very difficult for christians to be able to provide that without falling into nestorianism and i think you know, without giving too much away, that's what winds up happening with Tim's view. I, I don't think he really has uh, a metaphysical answer to this problem. I don't know anything about that more. That's an interesting point. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So that was that was just a claim about the, the derivation from E1 to E2. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Um, next point. You say you enter in uh, to the session after you know this. I mean, they're just presenting his view. Uh, yeah. And then you, you, you come forth is what you say. And um, there are three things I want to say there. One we've already talked about, but the first one is whether or not... Um, whether or not you have indistinguishable features in Nestorianism versus Cyril. Cyril like, um, there, let me start just with two quotations um, from the Church Fathers. And maybe, if you could, could you toss up that, mm -hmm. that, that yeah. thing I sent you? Uh, page yeah. four is what I'm looking for here. 
again, I'm going to skip over what Tim is saying here, just not because I don't want him to be able to offer his response to it, but just in the interest of time, I'll just explain very briefly what he's saying in this part, in these parts here. Um, because again, I, I don't really think it, it, it's anything that is going to change or the, in which the argument is going to turn on. Um, basically, what he tries to say in order to attempt to show a distinction between the heretical Nestorian view and uh, St. Kirill or St. Cyril's view is just to say, well, St. Kirill and Saint, uh, the Orthodox uh, Church Fathers, they don't have a problem ascribing certain predicates to the divine son or the person the, of the son, meaning they'll say things like God died on the cross or the son died on the cross um, or, you know, various predicates like that or that God, um, the son was born of the Virgin Mary, different types of predicates that will be ascribed to the human nature Typically, they are willing to then, by the communication of idioms, they will then ascribe it as well to, um, to the divine son. Okay, And so what he says is, look, these Orthodox Church fathers say this. They're fine with ascribing these semantic phrases to the divine son, whereas the heretics are not. And this is supposed to be a difference. And Mullins, what he winds up responding with, which is correct, is, well, yeah, they're saying that, but that doesn't show that there actually is a metaphysical difference. Maybe there's just an inconsistency on one of the party's sides of not affirming certain phrases. But in terms of the metaphysics, there's nothing that you can actually point to in order to ground that relevant semantic difference. It was called Fathers and Heretics um, uh, on this discussion. And so one of the things he points out is Cyril is really sloppy. Like there are points where, yeah, that's quite possible. So which is, and this is actually goes to like the, the broader argument that I have um, in both the papers, all the different papers I've written on this is to go, what's so unsatisfying and what seems to be, everybody keeps. Case that um, here Cyril says not that good pleasure alone. And maybe mm -hmm. it's the case that people you're referring to Something say extra. good pleasure alone doesn't. So maybe they're not saying the exact same thing there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's quite possible. So which is, and this is actually goes to like the, the broader argument that I have um, in both the papers, all the different papers I've written on this is to go, what's so unsatisfying and what seems to be everybody keeps trying to go is to say like, we never found a good account of the hypostatic union that actually solves this problem. And so what we have is a, throughout church history is a series of attempts to do that. Say so there's gotta be something more that really brings about this unity and we don't have it yet. And that's what I personally find unsatisfying is to go, okay, fine. Not good pleasure alone, we need more. What is that more? And please don't tell me just ineffable mystery. Like I, I want more. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. good. If that Next makes sense, point. Yeah. yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Cool. I appreciate that. Do you want me to bring uh, up the next... screen again? No, I don't think I'll need it for a bit. That was the longest quote okay. I had, and I think we probably won't need it for the other ones. Uh, and this way you can see all our faces. That's nice. Uh, so you say that the claim, uh, you claim that the responses to the two sons were look indistinguishable from the Nestorian heresies. Now, I disagree. So here I'm going to focus primarily on Cyril. Uh, you had him as your uh, whipping boy might be too strong, but a guy that you were uh, <laughs> chastising repeatedly during your time. So I'm going to. Uh, so anyway, in that last part, Mullins was saying exactly what I said and not to say that Tim didn't have a response. I don't want to speak for him, but he kind of just left it at that point and said, OK, yeah, and then moved on. And, and now he moves on to another point here. Not argue that he was a clean player, because I agree with you, he wasn't a clean player in all those debates. But I want to argue that he, um, well, you'll see what I want to argue. Okay. So Cyril himself was looking to give a response to the two sons' worry, just like you are. Uh, or, yeah, so he's looking for a response to it anyway. And he's giving it to a living, breathing patriarch, to Nestorius himself. And Cyril writes, in fact, here's a quotation from Cyril's second letter to Nestorius, again, accepted at Ephesus. He says, quote, If, however, we reject the hypostatic union as being either impossible or too unlovely for the word, we fall into the fallacy of speaking of two sons, end quote. So he's with you. There's a, there's a problem to be perceived here. But I think Cyril and Nestorius' views are certainly distinguishable in the following respect. They distinguish them themselves, as did their respective followers, and so did the Council of Ephesus and the following councils that explicitly affirm Cyril's letters as orthodox and Nestorius as heretical. And concerning the difference, Nestorius says in his second letter to Cyril, again, this is like accusatory evidence at Ephesus, but it's including in the documents at Ephesus, he says he thinks those are deceived who think that, quote, God the word shared in being fed on milk, in gradual growth, in terror at a time of his passion, and in the need of angelical assistance, end quote. So as we know, Cyril, or sorry, Nestorius didn't want to affirm very many of the more mundane predicates, the, the more creaturely things of the Lord, of the word. He didn't want to say the word suffered and so on. Cyril, on the contrary, responds in his third letter to Nestorius, again, included at Ephesus. I think all this conversation can just happen in Ephesus because it's at Ephesus that most of this is worked out. Cyril says, quote, the only begotten word of God took flesh from the Holy Virgin and made it its own, his own, 
undergoing a birth like ours from her womb and coming forth a man from a woman. So he wants to predicate all those more mundane creaturely predicates of the word himself. He wants to say the word suffered the word. Yeah, see what he's doing here. He's just mentioning all these semantic predicates that are being applied um, by orthodox, uh, but not by the heretics. And he thinks this is, a, a, you know, a substantive difference, but I don't think so. It's just a semantic difference. And the question is, what are the metaphysical grounds for supposed be making this distinction. And I don't think Tim ever really points to anything in that regard. And so they, they seem distinguishable to me in light of that. That's really good. Um, this is so this brings up some other questions that I, I was hoping we could get into. So one of them is, is so what we're talking about is the communicatio like the communication of the different properties of each nature onto the one person, God the Son. And this is a huge point of contention in the early church and on through the Middle Ages of distinguishing views on which predicates you think are follow over onto the person. And Nestorius does, like he's very clear, he's like, I don't want that predicate to follow over, I don't want that one to follow over. And Rasiro's like, no, no, they've all got to go. And this is something I feel like it never really gets sorted out of exactly how these entailment relations are supposed to work. And, and what I want to know, what I've always wanted to know, I think it comes back to the earlier point I made, which is if you've got a good account of the hypostatic union, then now you can see this is how these, these uh, predications are supposed to follow over from each nature onto the person and which ones don't. Since Cyril didn't give us that account, I want to know, well, Cyril, how, how are you making these moves? And in, in the story, is, I can kind of see why he's wanting, well, how he's able to make the entailment relations uh, he's saying. I can see why is he's going to say like there's two different natures here, um, and this one really is God the Son, and this one is the, like, the human nature. And so God the Son's he's eternal, he's not getting boring, come on. Whereas Cyril's like, somehow trying to get them to, to be more united, but I don't think he gives a story of how, what, what, what grounds the kind of predications that he's making, the, the, what grounds the, the intelligent relations which, uh, for the communicative matter. I don't think I'm saying that very well. Um, but basically, I, I feel like what I've got with Cyril is I've got this black box, and I'm told I'm supposed to be all these intelligent relations, but how is those working? Well, there's just this mysterious black box there, and I can't be inside to, to tell me what grounds these relations, uh, these intelligent relations. Yeah. Is the question primarily, um, what, are the, what are the logical operations we can do? Or is the question more metaphysical, like what grounds the logical operations we can do from nature to person? It's more the metaphysical question because like all the work that you've done satisfies in my mind, like this is like, if I have a story here of how these things are supposed to fit together, well, then this is like the logic of it. But I'm always like, but what's that hypostatic union that makes all of this work? Yeah, good. So uh, I started by saying they are in fact distinguishable, the Nestorian and the Cyrillic view. Do mm. you agree or disagree that they have different entailments? I want to say if, if, if the difference really is, since I'm interested in this metaphysical question, if the difference is just ineffable mystery, then I don't know how we are making any of these different kind of entailment relations. Uh, so I don't know how Cyril is able to get to where he's getting. I can't follow in his footsteps because the starting point was mystery. And so I'm like, okay, so I see you want to make claims X, Y, and Z. And I can see uh, the story is going, oh, no, 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 no. But I'm like, what justifies you making that? And he's like, mystery. I'm like, okay, now I don't know what the difference is supposed to be between you two. Because you both have a three-part Christology. You both have God the Son plus a soul plus a body. And you both say, you know, they're united in such a way that they're one. But but each side goes. I don't like what you say. Well, I don't like what you say. I'm like you got you still got the three part Christology. Like what's 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 the deal? What's going on here? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, one deal is one says God died for you, and the other one says yeah. God suffered for you, and the other one says God didn't suffer for you. That seems like yeah. a pretty important distinction to draw between you know who died for your sins. Was it God himself, or was it some created man who's very vaulted, very important status on the on the story of you, but not mm -hmm. in fact the Son of God? So I mean, there's something different about those two views that, that the Son of God died for you and he didn't. And I think they disagree on that. So there's got to be some distinction between the two views. Right, and I want to know what that is because I, I much prefer the direction Cyril's wanting to go because that seems to me that's what the New Testament's saying is God the Son himself came and died for us. And so I'm like, all right, right. how do I make sense of that? Because I think things like yeah. impassibility and all this sort of stuff, they get in the way of that sort of story. And Cyril's like, no, they don't. I'm like, okay, tell me how they don't. Uh, and he's like, mystery. I'm like, okay, and then I can see Sarah Coakley coming in going, he's abusing the mystery card here. I'm like, right. So, okay. So, on to maybe ineffable mystery. That sounds yeah. like the next place. Like so, that's exactly the point that Ryan is making. And he was correct to point that out is that. Well, Tim, you're just giving a semantic phrasal difference, but what is grounding the entailment relations for that from a metaphysical view? And there just doesn't seem to be any answer for that, right? So from a metaphysical paradigm, it's a mystery as to what the actual substantive difference is between the orthodox Christo Christological positions and that of Nestorius. It doesn't really seem to be much. There go. That's, there go. that's the next point I wanted to raise as well. Good. So um, you said, at least in what you sent me, I think I think you may have said this out loud as well. Um, and no shame if you didn't, because you weren't like bound to what you sent me on Monday. It was a yeah. kindness on your part to send it at all, so I appreciate that. But in what you sent on Monday, you said, quote, the main problem with this strategy, that is the strategy that Cyril employs, is that the hypostatic meaning is said to be ineffably mysterious, in which case we have no way of knowing the difference between orthodoxy and historianism. End quote. Now, we've already talked a bit about a way of knowing the difference, or at least on my view, a way of knowing the difference. Um, the second part, is it really an ineffable mystery? And in a word, yes. Yeah, you're right. That's pointed out. Uh, in the earlier quote I gave, the long one, if you read it a bit lower, it said it was marvelous and mysterious, the hypostatic union. Pause. Jordan, introduce us to that little schmooper. So he, he points back to he thinks he is making a distinction, but 
as Ryan's pointing out, as I'm pointing out, yeah, you are in terminology, but there's nothing actually to ground this difference in terminology uh, from a metaphysical paradigm. And at least you're not showing us clearly what the difference is. And then he goes on to say, well, are, is it just an ineffable mystery? He says, well, yeah, it is. And then he winds up, you know, giving quotes from the councils and church fathers to say that it is an ineffable mystery. Well, if it is, and just, you know, I mean, I mean, honestly, he's being very honest in, in this uh, interview, which I appreciate. Uh, he seems like a very nice guy. Um, but yeah, I think that Christians should just do that more easily and frequently, and we can just cut right to the chase. And if that is their position, they do take an orthodox Christological position, say, look, it's an ineffable mystery, right? Uh, we cannot define for you what are the sufficient conditions for human personhood or even what grounds, um, what grounds our semantics in terms of being able to say that this is a human person and this isn't, and this is a human person and here's another human person over here. It just doesn't really seem to be a clear, consistent answer to that. We're over here, so flow. No, I'm sorry. I, I get it. It says, there is one Lord Jesus Christ, even though we do not ignore the difference of natures, out of which we say that the ineffable union will, and it, it's clear, Brian is right. They do talk about ineffable mystery. Um, and I think, you're, you, Ryan, you don't like this sort of language. You said it here, but you also said it in your book, The End of the Time with God. And there you said, uh, quote, I find ineffable mysteries to be incoherent and repugnant to Christian theology, end quote. Yeah, sounds now, like uh, <laughs> I don't know whether you would accept that the seeming entailment of the Christology of the Ecumenical Councils from Ephesus on is incoherent, because after all, they use, inco they use ineffable mysteries. And that I don't know if you would judge that they're, what they say is repugnant to Christian theology. I mean, they do say it's ineffable mystery. You say that's repugnant to Christian theology. Um, so I don't know if, on your view, the ecumenical councils and the Christology of the church is incoherent and repugnant. Um, and I don't even know what you use as a standard to judge if something mm -hmm. is repugnant to Christian theology, if you're not pointing to the councils, at least in part, for setting that standard of Christian theology. Yeah, this is really good stuff. So I'm trying to remember um, the context for the first. So now the point that Tim is pressing Mullins on a bit, he's just saying, look, the councils say it's ineffable mystery. The church fathers say that it's ineffable mystery. So therefore, we accept that it's an ineffable mystery. We shouldn't be surprised that we hit this, you know, block in the road and that's it. We're just stuck, right? Um, this is basically what he's saying. And then he's saying, well, look, Mullins has a problem with ineffable mysteries, which he, he admits, okay? And then, but Tim is saying, well, how would you judge whether or not something is repugnant for Christian theology if it's not coming from the councils. Now, this is where it shows that Timothy Paul is a Catholic and Ryan Mullins is a Protestant, and they have different standards for how they view the councils and church tradition, which um, Ryan's going to explain that here. First quote where he says it's repugnant. Uh, was that when I was talking about just ineffable mysteries, like the definitions of it, being self referentially incoherent? Yeah, yeah. It's on page 102. I don't know actually what you were talking about at the time. Mm. Uh, I got the quote, but forgot the context. That's right. That's right. Because like, there's, because like, I can think of several different things I was saying. So, in one, in one kind of argument I would give is to go: ineffable mysteries are supposed to be these unspeakable mysteries. And I'm like, we just spoke about it, so you contradict yourself. And then I get this funny quote from Augustine going, "Yeah, I totally uh, contradict myself." And uh, yeah, what do, we, what do you want from me? And he kind of moves on. And I'm like, Augustine, you're like one of my heroes. Come on, man. Like, give me something better here than just going, "Yeah, I contradict myself." Uh, and, but then now that I'm older, I'm like, yeah, you know what? Sometimes like I have contradictory views too, for sure. And what we're trying to do is follow what Scripture says. And these different, well, not all the Protestant traditions will say is because you know, uh, and and so it's something that looks like the biblical account that we have, coherence, or it's preventing us from actually. So that's where I think a lot of times the repugnance comes in is it's, it's either just intellectually dishonest, it's incoherent, all the subsequent councils to clarify them. So they're making these claims because they're not convinced and because the mystery card kept getting played instead of clarifying them. And then we have to have all these subsequent councils to clarify them. So that's where I think a lot of times the repugnance comes in is it's, it's either just intellectually dishonest, it's incoherent, so I think it uh, is a stopper, a, it prevents theology from happening. There's some theology from clarifying. It didn't, it didn't really get us any clarity. And then that's why you have people, all these delegates in the East going, you guys look, that looks like some historianism. Well, what is a sickness? This is, a, you know, the grossness. And I'm like, okay, well, I don't think I'd say that out loud. Maybe on Twitter you'd say that, but, uh, you know, they didn't have Twitter back in that time. But, but they're making these claims because they're not convinced. And because the mystery card kept getting played instead of clarifying them. And then we have to have all these subsequent councils to clarify them. So that's where I think a lot of times the repugnance comes in is it's, it's either just intellectually dishonest, it's incoherent, or it's preventing us from actually getting clarity on something where we really need clarity because we need to get something that looks like the biblical account that we have. Now, in terms of authority, so I'm not Catholic, as you know. Uh, and, and so what I want to say is, is what a lot of different Protestant traditions, well, not all the Protestant traditions will say is the ultimate authority of scripture. And what we're trying to do is follow what scripture says. And 
these different creeds as I see them are attempts to try to get at what's going on in scripture. Uh, do they always do it very well? I don't know. Uh, there's this, uh, since we're on a Baptist show, I'll quote a Baptist for a second. So there's Augustus Strong. Uh, Augustus Strong has this really funny quote where he says, uh, the creeds are a witness of what the church fathers did believe. What do they believe now in heaven? I don't know. But, uh, but you know, this is a statement of what they did believe. <laughs> and, I, and I love that. I just like the cheeky kind of stuff. And I, and I think that's, that's yeah. kind of where I want to stand too. I'm like, I want to go with this as much as I can. But if you keep giving me incomplete stories, I'm not satisfied. The analytic theologian wants to go, no, give me a complete story. The church deserves a complete story as best as we can. Mm -hmm. well, I agree with you as best as we can. We might, we might, just, yeah. we might disagree about how far as best we can can go yeah, in yeah. this particular case. Um, I wonder too, if you think of ineffability as so strong as you can't even assert something about it, even saying ineffability is saying one too many things about an ineffable thing, maybe it's just too strong of a notion of ineffability you have. Maybe you need to ratchet it back a little bit so that people aren't immediately contradicting themselves and they call something ineffable. Yeah, so Parker in, in the chat, Parker uh, uh, said, said a cast, uh, he's pointing out um, that I'm a student of Keith Yandel. And so Keith Yandel has this great paper called uh, On Not Confusing Ineffability with Incomprehensibility. And one of the things he goes through is he points out, here's all these cases of ineffable mystery. Well, that's incoherent. If they mean this, it's incoherent. And, and like some earlier version of the paper that he published in like, the 70s, he does one of those like chisel things where you've got like 20 premises of like different versions of what it could mean. He's like, each one of those is incoherent. You're like, all right. Uh, what he does in the more recent paper is he's like, what they think about they really want is incomprehensibility, but that doesn't fit with what they're saying. Like they're clearly going with this incoherent notion. What most theologians should be saying is, well, yeah, I don't know everything. There's no more God. Uh, and I'm like, well, okay, well, I mean, yeah, that, that seems an obvious starting point, but why would I want to use this this language that quite literally means unknowable and unspeakable? And then even times like start wrapping myself in incense uh, when I say it and going like, look, you know, like it really is so this thing's completely beyond me. It's, un it's completely beyond comprehension. I'm like, well, you can comprehend it somewhat, can't you? Uh, otherwise, God can't reveal himself if it's completely unknowable and completely incomprehensible. So uh, what I what I do as a, as a post yandelian is that a thing? I don't know. I'll make it a thing. Um, as a post yandelian I want to say, We've got a lot of language we've inherited from past generations, and I think we should acknowledge when it's incoherent and, and really say what we should be saying, which is, no, God's not completely incomprehensible, because if he was, revelation's a non-starter. What we should say is, well, of course, I can't know everything there's no about God. It's not terribly interesting. And it was what Keith Handel would say, it's not religiously significant, because I can't know everything there's to know about my shoelaces. I don't worship my shoelaces. I worship God. Why? Because the things I do know about God. I know that he's all-powerful, that he's all-knowing, that he's on and on and on. So can I know everything about him? No, but it's not terribly interesting, because everything else is in the same boat. I don't know, I don't know everything there is to know about everything else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So this is the this is the issue that um, many Christians or many different groups, when you talk to them and uh, people get really stuck in, in a contradiction or a very difficult problem theologically. And you want to make this appeal to, quote unquote, mystery in the way that is being done here, which is very specific and, and distinct. Um, and the response or what they say always is, well, and I'm not saying Tim is not saying this at all, but many, you know, lay Christians that I've spoken to say, well, are you saying, Jake, that you know everything about God or about Allah? Well, no, of course not. But as Mullen's saying is, I don't even know everything about myself. I don't even know everything about this computer or this phone or anything else that exists or my shoelaces, as he said. So it's not terribly interesting to say that you don't know everything about God, of course. Nobody's going to be that arrogant to say that I know everything there is to know about God. No, that's not the claim. The claim is that you are making inconsistent claims within your own theology. You have a contradictory or internally incoherent um, theology, and there doesn't appear to be any resolution for it other than just saying it's an ineffable mystery. And being happy about it. So those are two different things. They're not the same thing to say there's not, I don't know everything about God. And here's this incoherence. And it's an ineffable mystery. Those are not the same thing. And people need to really understand the difference between those. So you, you had said at some points that Cyril was playing the mystery card. And Cyril was uh, was being cheeky. And that he wasn't uh, trying to analyze any further the concept of um, the union. And I think that's a bit too strong. Uh, so mm -hmm. for one thing... Um, for one thing, he tells us that it's the union can be understood, quote, in such a way as we may say that the soul of man does in his human body. That is, the sun is there. It can be understood in such a way as we understand the soul in the body. Now, he's not saying exactly the same way, but he's giving us some analogy we can employ to understand it a bit better. And he says, you know, it's not of good pleasure. He says it's not of dignity. He means not of authority. It's not of equality of honor or juxtaposition or relative participation or mere conjunction. So they say a lot of things about what the relation isn't and then give us some analogies for what it is. I'm wondering like, what what more do they need to do to satisfy you? Like take, uh, yeah. I, I'm offering to take some um take some other metaphysical relation that we use a lot, like instantiation. I can tell you some things about what it does. It relates one thing to another. I can tell you how it does it sometimes. I can tell you you know what it's for metaphysically. I can tell you some necessary conditions it takes. But I don't think I can give you an analysis of instantiation mm -hmm. that doesn't just repeat the things I just said. So what what more do you need to be satisfied with hypothetically? What do I have to say to get you to drive in this car and drive away today from my lot, the yeah. Christology lot? This is good. So 
I, this brings up a, something I, I don't think we mentioned at all yet. So it's the, how, what ex exactly is the relationship between the sun and the soul and the body? So it is very common in the early church. You have that analogy of going, well, it's kind of like the soul and body relationship. You see it in the Cappadocians. But something you see a lot as well is to go, the soul uh, acts as a wall to preserve the sun from the grossness of human flesh. That's Gregory of Nazianzus. Uh, and, and the idea being, well, because the sun is impassable, uh, we've got to have this other thing, the soul that does the suffering. Uh, and sometimes united, so we can say there's one there. And I'm like, well, now it looks like I've got some other person there doing the suffering on behalf of Jesus. Uh, and I don't know how they're, they're these two two different minds, each with their own will, each with their own thoughts, their own experiences. I don't know how they're the one, they're supposed to be one person. Uh, and so, because otherwise I could be like, yeah, the relationship between a, a soul and a body, that's really straightforward. But then I got to throw this other soul in there to kind of prevent the sun from, from suffering. I and mean, that's part of one of the motivations to throw that extra soul in there uh, is, is to preserve impassibility. And, I, and I'm like, oh, I don't, I don't like this. I don't know how this is supposed to work. So that's one of the things preventing me from being able to drive off a lot with you. But my, my question to you is mm -hmm. more, um, what else do you need to feel comfortable with the analysis given? Um, he gives us, he says, here's some nearby relations. It's none of those. Mm -hmm. He says, here's an analogy. He tells us some necessary conditions for it. They have to be natures. They have to be in a person. He tells us some necessary entailments of it. It undergirds the communication of idioms. That's a lot to know about it. What, I mean, when I think of other metaphysical relations, I know just about as much about part of it. I know just about as much about instantiation and adherence. All of these are posited for doing some metaphysical work. And it's not like we can explain how instantiation works. Like it's got hooks mm -hmm. that get into the platonic forms. Yeah. We just, we define it into, into our parlance, into our theory. What, yeah. That's what we do with hypothetic union too. Yeah, that's really good. Um, okay, so let me rephrase what, what I should have said a second ago. So it looks like I've got this really good analogy, the, the mind-body relationship, and say, okay, that's cool. I'm like, all right, I like this. Okay, I understand what that is. And that's, you know, and, and if you're already substance dualist, if you want to say what makes you a human is you're a soul employing a body. I'm like, okay, cool, cool. But then you're like, well, hang on a second. I know you're about to accept that analogy is really good. Let me throw this other soul in there really quick because the soul is a wall to preserve, to protect the sun from the grossness of human flesh. And I'm like, well, now I've lost the analogy you gave me. That seems the situation to me when I when I uh, bring in that, that, that sort of worry, that concern from Gregor of Nazianzus, that the soul is supposed to serve as a wall to protect the sun from the grossness of human flesh. I've lost the body-soul relationship analogy. Huh. So you have body to soul, and then you yeah. have that whole composite to word. So yeah. it's not like the body to soul, the soul to word. It's you have the word to the body-soul composite, just like the soul is to the body. I don't see how throwing in another soul. I, have, I actually don't think, well, you might know better than I do, but I don't remember them ever having like a, I don't remember that moving made at least explicitly. But hmm. even if one guy does that somewhere, I mean, it doesn't mean that you, you can't understand the analogy anymore. Well, it's it's not just that one. It's a very common move. So this is a common motivation for. Um, so Apollinarius, for instance, he gets rejected for lots of reasons. One of which is because it seems like he is violating impassibility. And so when you don't have that soul there, to uh, you're going to get the sun suffering in his, in his divine nature. And so that's why you see a very common move is this relationship to go. The sun is related to the soul, and then that soul is related to the body. Now, not everybody in church history makes that relationship. Um, uh, was it Anna Marmadoro and uh, Jonathan Hill have a, a nice paper on this? I forgot which one it is. Where they lay out all the they try to go historically, they lay out a taxonomy of all the different people, how they relate. So some of them go, well, the soul's the sun's directly related to the, the, the body and the soul. And some others are like, oh, no, no, it's only just through this. So there's there's differences throughout church history on this. Um, the concern I have is when I do have that other soul there, I've got a relationship between one rational mind and another rational mind, and I'm like, that looks like too many minds, too many thinkers to be one person. Uh, and so now I don't understand the soul body relationship anymore because the soul body relationship is one thinker, one body, one person, one body. Okay. Now I got two thinking things, each with their own free will related to a body. Okay. This, it's not schizophrenia, um, but it's, I, it's not, it's not the normal like substance dual sort of story I would, I would have, which I do understand. I'm like, yeah, if it's that, I can understand that. I don't understand how it's supposed to work when I've got two uh, thinkers and two wills mm -hmm. going on. So I think that's, I think that's, again, it's just this historian concern I've got. I see. Yeah, it strikes me that we know about as much about hypostatic union and its entailments uh, as we do about other primitive metaphysical mm -hmm. notions that we use often. Um, so I don't feel so much of a worry about about that there. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's good. I know we lost Jordan for a minute. So that's that's about the end of it. They, they go into a couple questions here, which I'll play one or two of them. But Mullins just reiterates the same point. It's like, well, yeah, I don't have a problem with the analogy of soul body. The problem is you're saying that Christ had two souls or there was a human soul and a human body and plus the divine spirit or soul, however you want to phrase it. And now I don't really know what that is. Now you have two souls with two minds and two wills. Well, how's that not two persons? And I just don't know how that works uh, or what, what's going on there metaphysically. And Timothy Paul, I mean, he's just basically saying, well, yeah, it's just, you know, an ineffable mystery. And, uh, his response at this point is to say, well, that's how it is for many other things in metaphysics, or he doesn't say science directly, I think, but in other things. And therefore, it's not really a big deal. But the problem is, and this is something that really needs to be pointed out, in Orthodox Christology, terms like person and nature, and these key f terms are so fundamental to Christian theology about making these distinctions. And they're on the most fundamental doctrines of the Trinity and incarnation, and even with respect to salvation. 
of whether or not you spend eternity in hell, it's like you would think that we would have a lot more clarity from the creator if he was truly revealing this, right? And what Mullins is saying, look, you guys don't seem to have any metaphysical story to give me that can sufficiently explain what the councils are trying to say. Now, Mullins is somebody who believes that Jesus is God. He believes in the Trinity. But his issue, and these are my own words, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but I would say in a modest way, his current issue is he's having trouble giving a consistent story of the incarnation from both when it comes to, uh, of course, he believes it's biblical, but in keeping it biblical while at the same time affirming what the councils say without falling into this ineffable mystery or into Nestorianism. He sees it very difficult to avoid that. And so he's, he's looking for Tim and other um, people to hold, who hold to the councils, which he himself said that that's what he strives to do as best he can. But when it breaks down and you're just left with incoherence, he, he's, he's wondering, look, you know, you guys have any answers or any options for me regarding this? And that's what he's looking for. And at least in this um, discussion back and forth, I think Tim was very nice and humble and honest. Um, but I think he kind of just admitted, look, we don't have an answer for this. Um, and that brings me to a point that I want to mention. There was a Discord server that I was invited to. Um, this is over a year ago, I think now, in which I was asked to speak to an individual by the name of Perry Robinson, okay, who has recently become a bit more public with his apologetics. And he's an Orthodox. Um, I don't think he's, I don't think he considers himself a scholar. I don't know, but he's knowledgeable. Okay, I'll give him that. And I was invited to a Discord server called the Orthodox Shahada Discord server to discuss in their own words, Jake, we want you to discuss with our most expert guy on the incarnation. And we can discuss these type of issues, which were related to this. How do you define person? How is it not two persons? What model of the incarnation do you hold to? These kind of things. And this expert or the most expert they had available on their Discord channel, Perry Robinson, who's um, older gentleman. He's older than me. Um, he told me straight up basically the same thing that Tim Paul is saying. He said, not only do I not think that we can give a proper definition of person or human person in terms of explaining sufficient conditions, um, Basically, you're saying, not only can I not do that for you now, I said, well, do you think that there's a, a project to be done in that regard, that it's possible to do so? He said, not only can I not do it now, I don't think we could ever do it, which is basically the same thing. He appealed to mystery. He said that it's basically mysterious. Now, people have been questioning me, and I know there, there have been comments recently made about Jay Dyer and this. Listen, I said I would debate Jay anytime. OK, um, I've made very clear uh, what that is. We, we can debate uh, theology, philosophy. We can get into that. If he wants to get into epistemology, um, he wants to get in Trinity versus Tawhid, incarnation, salvation. I've been willing to debate those, all those main topics. Uh, and we can do a comparative analysis. But anyway, um, the interesting part is that I was invited to this server. I was the only Muslim, I think, on the chat with whatever, 50 or 100 other people on this audio Discord chat. And both Jay Dyer, um, Father Deacon Ananias, and their other people, um, their other main guys on that server, were all there, wallahi, were all there dead silent the entire time I had a discussion with Mr. Perry Robinson, who was very nice when I spoke to him anyway. Um, over an hour, I spoke to him about this topic and that's what he said within the first 15 minutes, he basically told me, look, Jake, there's not going to be an answer to this. And there's never going to be an answer to this. I wish, honestly, I had the conversation recorded. 
it was very good conversation. But I think it really made quite clear uh, the weakness in the Christian position when it comes to Orthodox Christian theology, not theology, well, theology, but Orthodox Christian Christology, specifically um, when it comes to the incarnation and the ecumenical councils and trying to avoid uh, Nestorianism in a way. Uh, but they really, it seems very difficult for them to do so because they cannot provide a consistent, clear definition of the term person, which is fundamental to their theology, right? So anyway, uh, I thought I'd throw that in there. Um, I'm sure they'll probably wind up watching this later or somebody will send it to them and they'll either claim that I'm lying or misrepresenting the situation. But look, I'd be happy to have another conversation with Perry Robinson. But and he could say that I'm misrepresenting it. But I think that's very clearly what happened. The same thing that happened here. I don't have any problem with the guy. He was very nice. It was a nice, calm, cordial discussion. But um, he pretty much did the same thing. He said, yeah, Jake, not only do I not have an answer for that on that issue, he said, I don't think we ever will. Basically, on this side of heaven, I don't think we'll ever have an answer to this. That seems to be Tim's perspective as well from the metaphysical paradigm. Fine, if they're satisfied with it, fine. But I'm not, and even Ryan Mullins as a Trinitarian Christian who believes that Jesus is God, he's not, doesn't seem to be, at this point anyway, satisfied with it. Okay? So it's not only me, but anyway, let's listen a bit further, inshallah. Um, it's okay. There he is. Hey, let me unmute Thank myself. You. I'm back. So let's rock it. All right. So he's trying to take from what behind it is. Here's a fiction. So um, Aquinas following. Tim, I don't know. On, I think it's a different, a different any of the, the councils. I think I just don't know how you can make a non-physical thing become entirely physical. I, so I think it's a different, a different problem you've got. Okay, so here's another. Right, here's, a here's an interesting question here uh, from John. Um, how do you make sense basically of divine simplicity if the sun enters into a composite with a human nature? Tim, I don't know if you want to answer this because I think you possibly talked about this in one of your books. I can't remember. Yeah, I, um, I have two thoughts on this. First is you got to understand simplicity in the right sort of way. So um, Aquinas, following John of Damascus, will say that the simple God becomes complex. He says that the sun is both simple and complex, and um, you find that elsewhere as well. And that's a hot mess unless you understand the predicates the right sort of way. I think you should understand them like this. To be simple is to have a nature that's not composed in any sense of the word composed. And to be complex is to have a nature that's composed, you know, at least in one of the senses of the word composed. And insofar as Christ, uh, the word, prior to the incarnation, prior to the incarnation, the word has a nature which is not composed at all, on, on my view. Uh, then he fulfills the conditions required to be simple. So he maintains simplicity. And uh, he counts as complex insofar as he, in the incarnation, gains a human nature. So I think you do get you do get to preserve divine simplicity even when he enters into composition with the human nature. because. It's not that like the divine nature composes with the human nature. It's not that the word himself, the person, composes with the human nature. It's um, it's different than both those things. Cool. Let's see here. We've got so one the one potential problem is that Aquinas and many other classical theists, supposedly anyway, think that anything that is composite or has multiplicity in it must have a cause outside of itself. So if you have, in this case, the divine person, which has a divine nature forming a composite substance or being a part of a composite being, which includes now, in light of the incarnation, also a human nature. The question is, well, now Christ is a composite being, divine nature and human nature. What is a cause outside of this? composite being which is the cause of this union on the one hand if you say there doesn't need to be a cause outside of himself he can simply enter into that composite relationship relationship himself then the argument from composition in terms of every composite requires a cause outside of itself refutes itself or is inconsistent with the understanding of the incarnation itself which Timothy Paul himself affirms a version of what's called compositional Christology. It's the idea that Christ or the Son is a composite being, divine nature, human nature. Okay? So what is the cause of that? If, if under the classical theist understanding and argument from composition, anything that's composite requires a cause outside of itself, 
if it requires a cause outside of itself, well, then we've got to be a bigger problem on Christian theology. They want to avoid that, so they want to affirm Christ does into enter into this composite relationship without requiring an outside cause. Well, then that means he can enter it into himself without an outside cause, and therefore not every composite requires a cause outside of itself which refutes one of its own arguments for God's existence and a simple God in the, in the, you know, to begin with. So it's, it's got this kind of uh, problem of internal consistency again. Now, not only that, the other issue is, um, let me just listen to what Tim said here. It's simple and complex. And uh, you find that elsewhere as well. And that's a hot mess, unless you understand the predicates the right sort of way. Uh, then, insofar as he, in the incarnation, gains a human nature, it's, not, it's different in both those things. This is with the human nature. It's not that the, when he enters his composition with the human nature, because I think you do get you do get the preserved divine simplicity even when he enters into composition with the human nature. Yeah. The other thing is, how do you even preserve divine simplicity in the sense that how do you say that God or the Son, um, how because the idea with divine simplicity is that God is not composite. But under this model of the incarnation, which is literally called compositional Christology, you have the word, which is one part. You have the divine nature, uh, which is obviously part of the word. And then you have the human body and the human soul. You have a three-part Christology. If, this, if the Son of God is a composite of these three, then that therefore means that he's composite, he's not simple. And so how could you have divine simplicity in which one of the persons of the Trinity are composite and the other two are not? This is, this is a big problem for divine simplicity. And Tim gives two options. He says, well, here, it's not like this, and it's also not like this, but then he never tells us what it actually is like. And I don't, Ryan didn't, really respond back because this was just a question from the audience, but he didn't because seem to It's not that like the divine nature composes with the human nature. It's not that the word himself, the person, composes with the human nature. It's um, it's different than both those things. It's different than both those things. So Ryan looks up and he's like, okay, it's di he's probably thinking, well, it's different, but what's the difference? Like, you, you, you've told me what it isn't, but you haven't told me what it is. Um, he doesn't say that, but that's what I'm thinking. Cool. Let's see here. We've got, I don't know, let's take maybe one more question. Which one should we pick here? Um, let's show this one. one. So is there a way around the two sons worry if instead of absolute identity, we use relative identity in the spirit of Peter Geach, where something can be identical to why? With okay, so here's a very interesting question, which is related to um, what's called relative identity and Peter Geach. And as you know, you guys have heard me discuss relative identity many times with respect to the incarnation. And Timothy Paul answers this question as a Catholic, and uh, I think his answer was quite enlightening. So let's listen to what he had to say. That respect to X and so on. Tim, you, you've written on this, haven't you? Not on the two sons, or even, but on the relative identity, I've written a little bit. Yeah. Um, here, is a, here is an autobiographical lament, and it's that I have tried so hard to understand it. And uh, Joseph Jedweb. Uh, is a man of infinite patience and help and intellectual ability, and he's tried to walk me through slowly. But every time I try to take off the training wheels and think about relative identity, I fall straight off the bike. Um, relative identity theorists say that it could be the case that there is something X, X identical to something Y. Um, I could be one man with two labels. I have, you know, hi, I'm Tim. Hi, I'm Dr. Paul. Two different name tags on. And something can be true of the man labeled Tim and false of the man labeled Dr. Paul. One and the same thing, two different labels, X and Y, such that Leibniz's law fails. And Lord help me, I don't, I don't understand how that works. So um, I bet you a dollar someone can do something snazzy with relative identity theory and get out of any of these Christological worries. Um, but I just, uh, well, that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> you can do it. Fair. It works. I think and there's fair. one more question I'll show. Something snazzy with me. Two different labels, X and Y, such that Leibniz's law fails. And Lord help me, I don't, I don't understand how that works. So, and Lord help me, I don't, I don't understand how that works. So, um, so there you go. He's saying that uh, in order to have relative identity, you have to reject Leibniz's law. And he says, Lord, help me. I don't understand how that works. So if you're a Trinitarian Christian, 
and you think that your Trinitarian theory uh, needs relative identity, well, you have an expert here, an expert, uh, Timothy Paul, who's actually done a lot of work in regards to logic and predicates and all these kind of things with respect to the incarnation. He himself cannot really understand how you can reject Leibniz's law with respect to the Trinity or anything else and how that can make sense in a metaphysical way. And again, what he's saying when he goes on to say, well, I guess you could do things with it. I would accuse Tim of doing the same thing. You can have a logical system or theory or semantic theory in order to explain certain things and have a consistent way of speaking. But what are the metaphysics that ground that? And what is the metaphysical story behind that? That's another thing which neither Tim himself nor relative identity theorists, I think, have. They don't really have a metaphysical story that is successful to back that claim up. And I think Leibniz's law is just necessarily true. And to deny that is going to plunge into absurdities. I bet you a dollar someone can do something snazzy with relative identity theory and get out of any of these Christological worries. Um, but I just, uh, well, that's all I have to say. <laughs> you can do it. It's fair. Works. And fair. there's one more question I'll show uh, regarding the distinction or definitions between ineffable and incomprehensible. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's hmm. uh, yeah, I guess I should say I'm not entirely satisfied with incomprehensible either, because if God's incomprehensible, then he can't reveal himself to us in any comprehensible way. And since Christianity is kind of a religion based on revelation, and God revealing himself and making himself known in some kind of comprehensible way, then I'm like, maybe we should just kind of dial down all of these claims and go, yeah, I don't know everything there is to know about God. And that's all we really should be saying. Yeah. I kind of think that. Yeah, so Ryan is basically saying there's a difference between ineffable mystery and saying, I don't know everything about God. It's fine to say you don't know everything about God, but when you're jammed with a contradiction and based on what you do affirm or you do claim to know, there's a difference between not knowing something about God, okay, and lacking to make claims about it versus making claims which seem to be incoherent and then just saying, well, yeah, I know. It looks like a missed, uh, contradiction, but just throw your hands up. Those are two different things. Um, so I, I, I approach these questions sort of from a Thomistic point of view, or maybe a more generally a scholastic point of view. And I think that something is conceivable uh, in a hierarchy of concepts. You know, you've got like a color, which is a quality, which is a, so on and so forth. And I guess what I think of when I think of ineffability is I think that there are some things out there, like the hypostatic union, like uh, that when we take our, our um, fundamental concepts, like the Aristotle's 10 categories, for instance, they don't fit neatly, wholly into any of those categories. I don't think the hypostatic union is an accident. I don't think it's a substance, created substance either. I think it's its own certain sort of thing. I think there's a sense in which God is a substance, but I'm not going to say it's a substance in exactly the same sense that I'm a substance. So I think you're, maybe you can say something is ineffable when it, um, it doesn't fall under your, it doesn't neatly fit into your concepts that you derive from creation. Maybe you could say it that way, I'm not sure. And then you could say that the hypostatic union is ineffable and it's got more grist than just saying it's incomprehensible. Because as Ryan pointed out, my shoe or whatever is incomprehensible to me. Do you think you should that. just get better concepts then in that case? Well, I can get disjunctive concepts, but I don't know how to form the concept. Of, I mean, I have a concept of a, a thing which unites the natures, and mm. the concept of a thing which undergirds a hypostatic union. But I can't give you genus and difference to define the species of hypostatic union. Mm. I see. Good. Cool. Well, thanks to you both for taking the time to do this. As a reminder, if you're listening, if you want to support the... Okay, so there you have it, folks. I think it was a very good discussion, very enlightening um, again, the link to the original video is in the description of this video. I did my best to be charitable to what Tim was trying to say. Of course, I agree with um, Ryan's argumentation. As I said, I have a video on this subject making the same type of points over three years ago before I even knew Ryan Mullins. Um, and if you're interested in further details on what he had to say, what his concerns with Orthodox Christology are. Um, he has an article on that called The Two Sons Wary. There's also another link in the description of this video where I have mentioned several times already, um, and I put that uh, I interviewed Ryan on that paper in quite a bit of detail on my channel discussing that issue. So you can go and view that to get a further um, understanding and a more detailed, comprehensive look at some of Ryan's criticisms in that regard. I hope that you all enjoyed this video. 
um, whether Christian, Muslim, atheist, or otherwise. Um, I tried to review the video as, as best I could in, in an honest fashion. And um, yeah, uh, there should be, as I mentioned in previous videos, I'm going to be doing a couple videos coming up soon, inshallah ta'ala, on um, Sheikh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah and his works and reading from some of his texts and explaining them. So be on the lookout for that maybe next week or within the next couple weeks, inshallah. But anyway, thanks again, guys, for watching. Until next time, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.